Hello, hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Volume sound all right? Maybe. What about now? Can you guys hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? All right. Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for being patient. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, thanks for joining, guys. Um, today we're going to do a, a webinar on day trading Momo for swing traders. Um, and I'll go through, you know, how we're going to approach that. Um, my name is Jesse, aka Psycho on Wall Street. I'm with uh, Michelle um, at Offshore Hunters at TradeOnTheFly.com. Um, so today we're going to talk about the uh, I, I don't know, I don't know why it's poison or what day trading Momo. Everybody's got labels. They're just financial instruments. So um, yeah, we'll go ahead and, and we're just going to look at it as, as day trading. Um, and day trading Momo specifically, uh, because that's one of the things that I get asked a lot is, you know, how, how do you day trade? Do you change things when you day trade? Um, how do you play the Momos, et cetera? And quite frankly, a, a lot of the things are similar, but when we get right down to it, um, the goal for you guys today, or at least my goal today is to, yeah, I'm recording too, Michelle, sorry. Um, the goal for today is to simplify things for you, not to teach you what to do or how to do it, but how you can simplify things for yourself. And I say that because, you know, I've been on a ton of webinars too. I, I did a lot of research and trading before I got into um, trading stocks. And there's just so many different formulations and, and systems that people have coined and trademarked and patented, et cetera, and they say they work. And, and you know what, at the end of the day, it all comes down to you. You push the button or you don't, you know what I mean? And, and you choose when to sell and you choose when to buy. That's really it. So you can put a system in front of you, but if you don't act on it, if you don't take the time to understand it, the whys behind what you're doing, um, then it doesn't really matter. And, and so that's the thing. Rather than throw another system at you guys, um, I went back through all of the Momo um, trades that I did uh, from the beginning of the year, and I came up with about 20 of them, um, and then I added in some shippers in the reggae IPOs to talk about themes. Um, but... Uh, I added up all of these and I looked at the way I traded them and then you know I thought to myself this is just too difficult it's even too difficult for myself I'm a swing trader and, and, and I trade Momo as a secondary tool to have when the opportunity presents itself um, because my you know my train of thought is why why shouldn't I um, if, if the trade is there and it's it's a, a cut and dry trade non emotional trade then yeah I'll go ahead and take it if I plan for it if I prepared for it practice etc and we'll go through that today um, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, trading Momo as a swing trader. There's nothing wrong with day trading as a swing trader. There's nothing wrong with cross pollination whatsoever. I think actually the only thing wrong is, is if you pigeonhole yourself into a corner and limit 
what you can learn and what you can utilize in the market. So that's the purposes. I, I went back through and I looked at how I was trading them and then I came up with this different, just kind of outside the box way to look at them that just simplifies it down and I'm, I'm excited to show it to you guys um, and you know I'm excited to try it out. So here's what we're gonna do. The agenda for today. What causes the big moves? Um, we're we're going to talk about you know the triggers, um, whether it's news, trial data, you know a, a short squeeze, what have you. Um, we're going to go through those. And just as a caveat, you guys, um, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I have a new five-month-old, who's half Great Dane and half uh, Mastiff, and his name's Buddha, and he's a handful. He's uh, 40 pounds now, up from 15 when we first got him. But if you hear him in the background. I'll just talk over it, and uh, for the, the recorded version, I'll make sure I filter out all the background noise. So if there's anything you guys can't hear, or if they get out of control, just let me know. Um, so what causes the big moves, the triggers, whether it's news, um, an event-driven, whether it's an area-driven, a short squeeze, et cetera, where to find them? And I get asked that a lot, like, how do you, how do you find pre-market movers? And just so you guys know, I am a firm believer that no question is a stupid question. We were all brand spanking new at one point. So when I do these webinars, I, I, I do them as if I'm trying to explain um, to someone who has just started training. So if any of this is, is redundant or you know you think it's not for you, that's okay. Um, you know Later we'll be talking about some of the more technical aspects of it. Um, so where to find them? And we'll talk about some different ways to trade them. And then most importantly, um, proceeding with caution and that's how I'm going to start out this webinar too because I don't want anything to look um, like like it's easy the everything about trading the math and everything is is, is very uh, is very linear it's the emotional aspect um, that most people have a, a challenge with and you've seen a, a lot of the top um, top traders in Fintwit I've been focusing on process and emotional control um, over the last I don't know six nine months pretty much since the beginning of the year so um, the reason why I want to start out with proceeding with caution is you have to know what you're trading before you get into it so we'll talk about some of the things to look out for as well okay so and, and again you'll see that big warning right here I'm gonna be very very blunt okay very blunt and I apologize if I offend anybody or if I'm talking trash about you know a stock that you're holding or whatever but you guys have to understand these low float names, typically they're between one and five dollars, and tend to be three dollars and under. Um, with you know, two million in the float, what what have you? It, it, these companies are cheap for a reason. There's a reason why they're trading at one dollar. Okay, a lot of them are just straight up turds, and that's how you have to look at it. But you know that old saying, you can you, you can polish a you can't polish a turd or what have you. No, but. Um, you can trade it for you know 25 cent gain on a thousand shares, and and I'm okay with that. So, what I want you to understand first is this is this approach is non-emotional. There's zero emotion in this approach whatsoever. All I look at is the ticker. I don't look at the news. I don't look at anything except price and volume. So I want to tell you that, or I want to mention this before I start off because I and I, I say this because I used to be that guy when I'm thinking to myself, you know. How much money I'm going to make when the 50,000 shares of you know whatever OTC or you know penny stock or what at 12 cents goes to the moon on on a buyout rumor or a trial rumor or something. Um, and so my 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 caution to you or my my unsolicited advice and I apologize for giving it is just stay off of iHub, stay off of the Yahoo message boards. Just don't let that stuff creep in because if you're in a trade and you don't put a stop in. And you start averaging down, you're going to start reading into the story, and you're going to start looking for for thing, uh, little hope icons that you can grab onto um, while you're losing money day after day. Um, so, and that's a little extreme, but here's the thing: just don't get attached. Just keep your emotions out of it. This is about as black and white as you can get when it comes to a process. Um, so these are high risk and, and, and they have crazy volatility, okay? And I say people are high risk, high reward, okay, you know, low floats, they're just high risk because you don't know what's gonna happen. That's really, it. it's high, reward if you're lucky, essentially. Um, and, and I say that because we're gonna look at this based on probabilities and not betting or gambling or just flying blind, okay? 
Um, so these are high risk and crazy volatile. Um, they could get halted and you could be stuck in it for who knows when. I, I think um, Modern Rock was stuck in one for like six months one time. And, and you have to remember when you're, when you're shorting, when you're borrowing, um, and, and Michelle, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you're still paying your borrow fees while it's halted. So that's another thing that a lot of people don't think about. Um, play small, especially if you're new. Um, play smart. And, and I let me, real quick, because as a new trader, these types of plays are the most attractive and sexy plays you will see when you're starting uh, out trading. You see things that go from 10 cents to 90 cents in a day or what, what have you, and those are what you think about, what you want to, so you start buying them, hoping that one's going to, you know, do your thousand percent jump or what have you. Um, so just play small, please. Go with small size, don't load the boat, so to speak, or back up the truck or whatever you want to call it. Play smart, don't get greedy. Yeah, things can go higher, but you're not in there to, to get the top. Um, or uh, let me rephrase that. I'm not in there to get the top. I don't want the top and I don't want the bottom. I just want what's in between and even a little piece of it is fine with me. Um, you have to respect the action. You have to respect the price action. Um, it, it's, it's all that matters in these plays. It's it, price and volume. And that's where we're at right there. Price first and then volume. When I say I trade price and volume, that means two things. I trade price. The price needs to get to an area that I've identified as a key area for a trigger. The volume needs to be at a specific amount within that time frame based on my trade in order for it to be a confirmation. And we'll, we'll go through that in a second. So the, that's, that's the, uh, um, the skull and crossbones here, like proceed with caution. These companies are, are, are cheap for a reason. Um, they have a tiny amount of, I mean, essentially a lot of these companies are just, they're ATMs, they're just printing money. You know, like Dries is one, AEZS is one. All they do is just print more shares to sell to people to buy in, you know, these crazy it's a shelf offering. Keep it on the shelf. Um, and, and that's the other thing, too. I, I am not going to get into fundamentals or lockups or shares available or dilution or anything like that um, because it doesn't matter with the way I look at these. Okay, triggers. What causes a surge? It's, you know, for these moves that are crazy, it's either news or it's a short squeeze. There's only two things that can happen. Nine times out of 10, it's news combined with a short squeeze. So you have these, you know, bottom of the barrel, companies, plays, stocks, etc., And a lot of them already have heavily shorted percentages because people are aware that these companies are garbage and they're gonna go to zero eventually. The challenge is, is sometimes, when a lot of people are shorting a company, the company puts out news, and if it's good news, then what you see is a short squeeze. So the two things that cause a surge, it's either news or a short squeeze. So what type of news gets these going? Trial data, earnings announcements, contract announcements, organizational changes, milestone payments, etc. These are all things that can, that can tip the scale in the favor of a long trade when these things go crazy. Um, And so when I say trial data, it's specifically for biotech. They're releasing trial data that was either positive or negative, you know, Um, and that's really it. Positive, typically they fly, sometimes negative flies too. It just depends on what the price does and what the volume does at that price. Um, And when I say a contract announcement, um, I think... uh, what was it, ELTK or Specs, or, or someone got a large contract that was like the same size as their market cap. So that's something that'll, that'll uh, get them going. An organizational change, adding you know, board members or, or, or previous advisors from other companies, big name companies come down here and, and play in the, in the gutter. Those sometimes will make them um, jump. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but um, if any of you guys were here two years ago, there was a company that was like, a, I don't know, it was trading like 99 cents and Carl Icahn's son or something um, ran the company and Icahn bought some shares and, and it ran like a thousand percent or something like that. But those, those are organizational change. That's, it's just adding a name. Um, and sometimes it's taking a, you know, someone that's in a, a director's seat out that's not good for the company, you know, however people perceive the news. Milestone payments. Um, if a manufacturing process of a biotech company, um, 
you know, they hit a certain milestone or sales milestone, et cetera, they may get payment incentives from um, the, the larger biotech companies that they're partnered up with. Um, and those will also kick them off. So news typically is what gets these things going. And those are some of the types of news that you can um, learn to identify when they come out, um, you know, rather than reading through the 300 headlines that come out at five o'clock in the morning, um, you can skim through and know what to look for. So here's the squeeze. Um, and this is taken from investopedia.com. I just, you know, my definition is the same as everybody else's definition. So what is a short squeeze? A situation in which a heavily shorted stock or commodity moves sharply higher, forcing more short sellers to close out their short positions and adding to the upward pressure on the stock. A short squeeze implies that short sellers are being squeezed out of their short positions, usually at a loss. A short squeeze is generally triggered by a positive development that suggests the stock may be embarking on a turnaround. Although the turnaround in the stock's fortunes may only appear to be temporary, few short sellers can afford to risk runaway losses on their short positions and may prefer to close them out, even if it means taking a substantial loss. So that's all you're going to get on definitions today. Um, Google is amazing for this. Investopedia is amazing for this. Um, and then following that, here's, here's the thing. Nate, Nate's crew, Nate at Investors Underground, um, you know, Nate, Modern Rock, um, Alex, the, uh, um, some, some of the other guys, you know, that jump out, uh, th those guys, this is what they, they built their career on, is it, shorting. I, I didn't do that. I'm not very good at it. I'm getting better. Um, but I tend to play to my strengths. So in these, I typically play the long side because it's easier for me to identify based on price and volume versus the short side. Some people will say, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's okay because I'm the one trading and not you. Um, so I very rarely short, especially in this type of market. Um, but this is essentially what um, a short squeeze is. And when you can identify those, um, you can take advantage on the long side. Okay, how to find them. So the, the first place that I would look is your trading platform. Typically, I use E-Trade. Um, and typically most of the platforms have what's called like a, a market movers or a, a day's gainers or what have you. Um, and uh, this is what I have set up in E-Trade. It's pretty simple. Um, and I customize my rows to only see the data that I wanted to see. So I've got 20 rows. Um, it's got the news so I can see, you know, what the news is in a one glance. I just click on it, it pops up. Uh, the bid and ask, the last trade, percent change, and the volume, previous day's volume, and 10-day volume. I just want to see what the volume looks like comparative to uh, the previous week. And that's how you can see some real large discrepancies in volume and be able to, to catch on to some of those moves um, in the early part when they get started. Um, and so I, I think you can see the only indicators I have on this, or the only columns I have on this, are price and volume. That's the only thing I want to know. Another place you can look, Yahoo Finance, and I, I apologize, I am very non-politically oriented. Uh, I couldn't do anything about this picture, so if anybody's anti or pro or what have you, just keep it to yourself. Um, Yahoo Finance is a great place. Just go to Yahoo Finance, and you can look on, click on the Markets tab right here, and you've got Most Actives, Gainers, and Losers. And quite frankly, you guys, it, it's almost embarrassing to say it, but it's okay. I didn't even have the E-Trade Pro, uh, Pro platform on my desktop. I used the web-based version for like almost two years. Um, and uh, on the web-based version, I didn't even know where to find this. So for the first year, I was using Yahoo Finance just to track the gainers, um, you know, when I get to work in the morning. Uh, and the other place is the NASDAQ website. Same thing, click on markets and you've got extended hours, pre-market activity and after hours activity. Um, so those are some places you can go to find them. You can set up custom screens all you want or intraday scanners, etc. That's entirely up to you. I just keep it simple so I have that tab up um, in the morning when I get started. So let's look at the low float Momo. And these are, and there's there's been quite a bit more um, than these. I, I think there's, like I said, I think there's about 20, 18 plays on there. Um, these are the ones that I actually participated in. Um, and I, I, the only reason I chose those, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not very good at, at planning trades that I'm not going to be in or wasn't in or, or describing them. So I just used the, the trades that I um, took um, on these Momos since the beginning of, of the year. So what we're going to do is we're going to run through these real quickly. Um, 
And I just want to make sure that I point out, even though you'll be able to see it, I want to point out the, the similarities in these charts. So we're going to start off with AEZS. And so you've got, here's your breakout. And I think it was one to almost 350, so it's a 200% gainer or what have you. Um, but you can see what happens. Here's all I want you guys to look at on these day, on these charts are day one, day two, day three. Okay, that's it. And really, you don't even need to look at day three unless day two setting up. So, what we're going to look at is the first and second candles after these breakouts. Okay, and what I want you to see is the trend, the pattern, what happens on these things that move 300% in a day. Um, you know, the, the following day, the day after, what time, time frames they pop at, etc. So AEZS, ELTK. Now, this the first example, you got this long top wick right here. Second example, long top wick right here. Huge spike, crazy fade. CLNT. Huge spike. Look at this top wick on the fall through the next day. Crazy fade. I'm not going to keep saying it. You guys will be able to uh, be able to see it. But top wick, top wick, top wick. And these, it, it, you know, I set these up by date, um, and I did that because they they don't just randomly happen. Typically what happens is a theme starts and the, the one that really kicked this off was I think it was De December and January. It was like IDXG, ETRM, um, HTGM, CBI, all these just low flow bios started exploding. And you'll you'll see a theme in the time frame, there's a group that happens and then they cool down. And then it just takes one more to kick back off and then okay we got runners again and that and that's really what happens and when I say that is because this part last year December January when we got to that point it it was you know we hadn't seen a couple hundred percent runner I think or not to my knowledge um, in a while and, and when these when these popped that's the thing when you don't have any of these when you don't have any 50 percent gainers or 100 percent gainers or 30 percent gainers when you don't have any of those for a while Things get a little bit, you know, flat in this uh, specific demographic of trading. People who trade these Momo trades. Um, but when they do happen, when there's not, when none are going on, and one kicks off, typically that that first couple, one, two, three, those are the best ones. Those are the ones just absolutely rip. And and the reason is there's there's no other options. People who are playing Momo, people who are playing these. That's the only one to play. So typically that first one will absolutely launch, which is what you saw here. And it went from what, like two $2 and change peaking out at 30 bucks. That's a monster move. One, two, three, top wick, fade. Look at that. Now, once this happened, that Momo started spreading. So over the next, uh, I don't know, week or two weeks, there was two or three, four more that when they had similar setups, similar volume, similar price action, they had monster moves. And uh, that, the, the only reason why I brought that up is is there's themes here. Everything the, Everything's a part of a bigger cycle. It cycles within cycles within cycles. Um, and so this particular niche right here, these Momo low float, low float high volatility plays, that's a theme. And when that theme gets some traction in the marketplace, you can make some really nice gains in a short amount of time um, if you know if 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 the uh, the environment is right and and quite frankly we've been in, in an awesome environment for this for the last uh, you know six nine nine months etc so C bio same thing MBRX MTBC, CLSN, this is the one we were looking at, CYCC, all these ones that happened in April too, it's, I, I was on vacation, 
Um, and it was the first, I take three days off. It's the first time I take time off in like four or five years. And, um, we were at, we were, at, and I just remember every morning when I woke up, cause I mean, you can't go on vacation and at least not trade in the morning. You know, who, who does that? So I woke up and we've got these just crazy runners every single morning. Um, and that's just another example of how, how they happen, um, you know, in themes, in groups. TNXP, same thing, same time frame. HTGM, same time frame. IDXG, couple. One in that Q4 and then in the Q1. Caper, right here. I think this is the one that was in the group. And I mean, you can see these, these historical runners, previous runners, they pop multiple times. It's like a basketball, boing, 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 boing. And the bounce gets smaller each time. Specs, recent one, gold top wick. CBLI. So, this is where we can start getting into some of the technical aspects of it. Um, and and I'll, I'll specifically tell you that um, I'm not going to get too much into uh, depth about trading VWAP or, um, you know, which moving averages or indicators to use um, in, in your Momo plays. I, I, I used to use VWAP uh, religiously, um, and, and now I, I won't. Um, based on what I found. And that's only for these quick day trades. And so, and so you guys have an understanding of how I approach these. These, these are very, very, very fast trades. Um, so what we've got here are all of these charts that we just showed you. And you can see I broke them down by date. So we've got, you know, that December, January time frame. You got that March, April time frame. And then you've got recent ones in the summer. Now, when we're looking at things that matter, when I was looking at, when I go back and review the trades, which I hope you guys do, I wanted to go back and find some some sort of correlating pattern, you know, no, nothing earth breaking or groundbreaking. I just wanted to make things easier for me. Hey, Buddha, relax. His name's Buddha. Um, and so what I did was I just pulled out, you know, what the average daily volume was pre-break. Um, what the trigger was, whether it was a previous runner, uh, what the three minute open volume is, uh, the three minute open percentage. And then I went to the, the 30 minute open volume, 30 minute uh, volume percentage of the day. And I'll walk through this really briefly, but essentially I just wanted to know what was important to me. And it was just price and volume at what time of the day, because these happen so fast. So when we look at these, I wanted to find out, you know, what it was, what the event was. And so when you're looking through these, these are all similar events to what we had on that list. Just, you know, it's just significant news. And a lot of these you'll see their, their healthcare and their biotech. And those are the ones that typically have large short percentages or, or more frequently, um, I would say. Um, and, you know, low float that have some sort of you know, IND or NDA or uh, tri trial results, data, et cetera, something that, you know, people love to latch on to and um, uh, get the price going. So you can see the, the average daily volume pre-break. You know, most of these are under 100,000. And what I wanted to do was I just, I didn't want to do anything pre-market because I never trust it. I just wanted to look at what was the action from from open to the first 30 minutes. And I wanted to break that down in three minute intervals and as a whole on a 30 minute interval. And then look at some of the, the outcomes of that. And so that's what we're gonna do today. Just kind of walk through, and you guys, I did this on my own. You can do this on your own. Um, you can build it however you want, but this is the data that's in here, the data points are specific to me. So this is everything that I look at. I'm not telling you what you should look at or this is what you should do. I'm just saying that this made trading these so much easier for me. Um, so when we look at the three minute open volume, 
we look at what percentage of the daily volume. And I'm running average daily volume. Does everybody know what average daily volume is? It's the average daily share count that's been traded over a period of time. So I go off of three month. I just always have, I might change it in the future, who knows. I just go off of what the 90 day rolling average volume is. And then what I wanted to see was what percentage of that daily volume happened right at open. Um, and what I found was most of these um, are are 5% of daily and above. I would say 90% of these are 5% of the daily volume and above. So within three minutes of the opening bell, IDXG had traded 6% of the previous days or previous time, 6% of the average daily volume over the last 90 days. So, ooh. so the average daily volume was 70,000. IDXG traded 70,000 shares a day until the breakout day. On the breakout day, within the first three minutes of open, it traded 4,200 shares, which is 6% of that volume. At 30 minutes, it was at 31,000 shares, which is 44% of the volume. At the end of the day, 8 million shares, which is 114 times average daily volume, okay? So it opened at 4.70, 6.30 a.m., five minutes after open, it was at 8.73. Whoa, what? What? Well, that, that is, that must have gotten switched around when it formatted it. Okay, we'll look at the next one, MBRX. 195, five minutes after open, it was 2.20. It's a 12% gain. 10 minutes after open, 227. Now it's a 16% gain. High a day was 360, which is an 84% gain. But th this is why I wanted to uh, lay this out for you, is it's probabilities. I didn't want to trade VWAP. I didn't want to look at the news. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to look at two or three data points and then put it into a, a format that had a high probability. So when you look at these, five minutes, if, if on all of these trades, if you just had a, a buy it open or even buy after three minutes, your 10 minute average gain is 19%. If you just hold that thing for 10 minutes after you buy it, 19%. Five minutes, you averaging 12%. And that, these are all the ones that, that I've played. I mean, there's probably a hundred of them that I, I don't know about. Um, maybe not many, maybe 20. But either way, bought it open, 12% after five minutes, 19% after 10 minutes. Now, when you look at it, people are going to say, well, yeah, but you could have had 109% or 240% or all of that. Yeah, I, I could have, and I could have sat in front of my computer and stressed myself out all day and never went to the bathroom because I was watching one-minute charts on these things because they move 50 cents to two bucks at a time. Or I could just check the market movers in the morning, see if there's ones that fit my criteria, wait for the open, watch for three minutes, buy, wait for seven more minutes and sell at 10. You know, it, it, it's, the, the point is, is it's so easy to make things more difficult by adding data. It's, it's like people want to have 15 different screens and 40 different indicators. So the easiest way for me to trade these things is to find a, the highest probability way to do it, which in these market conditions so far, based on this data, is to buy it open, and if you want to scale, you could sell some five minutes after open and sell some 10 minutes after open and sell some 30 minutes after open if you wanted to. But either way, it's entirely up to you what your process is, what your risk management is, what your um, your sell areas are as far as exit percentages, et cetera. That's all on you. So what I'm showing you today is just a framework on, on how I trade these Momos um, and specifically relating to me the safest way possible because I am I am the guy and I will admit it because I you have to know what your faults are I am the guy that averages down I am that guy um, if, if if I give myself the opportunity now let me back that up and say I haven't averaged down in a long time because I use stops and my process doesn't allow it um, but I know as a new trader especially when these things when you see something go up 200% and it comes back down to 100% you're like oh that's a great place to add I'm going to go right here 
and then all of a sudden it drops another 25%, you add again, drops a little bit more, you add again, and all of a sudden you, you turned a winner into a loser. And our number one goal is to not make money, it's to protect our capital. Because if we have a process, and the process is consistent, then that money will come. We just have to focus on choosing the right setups. So, for these, I didn't break it down into to mean um, mean uh, averages and, and ranges on these, um, but you can see there's a very, very clear 5%, that 5% of the previous rolling average daily volume, that's what I look for now is that 5%. And and honestly, after a couple a couple uh, months of doing this, I don't even like doing the 10 minutes even more. I just do five minutes because for me, if I can spend five minutes and let's see, three out of 18, I don't even know what percent that is. Let's just call it 15%, 20%. Um, if three out of 18 are bad and the other ones are good, then you know, quite frankly, if my average is 12%, I can have a little bit more cushion on these. I don't want to, I'm just saying, is that when you find a high probability system, you put in place and, you get in consistent, and you're getting consistent results, don't mess with it. That's, that's that, that secondary trade that becomes automatic for you, if that makes sense. So the whole point in me doing this was showing you guys that you can look at these, break them down, and find common characteristics Put it to you know you can map it to a, a, a time you can map it to price you can map it to volume um i i just quite frankly again i need to see the price and the volume um and it needs to happen in the first three minutes of the day uh, and then i'm out at five or ten so in does that make does that make sense everybody if not um i could do a blog post on this to explain a little bit more but Right here, essentially, again, this is just me showing you how I simplified the aspect to take my emotions out of it. So themes, we were talking about themes. So the, the most recent theme that I think is, is tattooed on everybody's brain um, is the shippers, you know? And <laughs> it, they just, when they, when they, when this, when the, these types of, um, I don't want to call them anomalies because it's cyclical. This this hasn't the first time it's happened to a sector or to the shipping sector. What happens is these shippers have been beat down for I think it was two or three years, or they were just beat, 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 and then, you know, we had that. Um, what was it? Uh, yep, last quarter. So these just started taking off, and we're. I mean, if you weren't here when they were happening, it's it's just, you know, honestly, it's just pretty impressive to watch. The volume, just the force at which the move occurred and just did not slow down. I mean, in, in some of these charts, because they're now reflecting multiple reverse splits um, since this happened, uh, they don't show true values. But this one right here, this, I mean, this literally went from one to eight bucks in two days. Two bucks to 22 bucks. Oh, obviously it didn't go up to 800,000, um, but I, I think it went up to like 45 bucks or something like that. And that was from, gosh, I can't remember how low it was when it started, but the, it's, it's funny because you try to say, you know, something that's going to click or stick or whatever, but really it's just price and volume. You guys, these things, when they start moving like this and you start seeing um, float rotation, and I'll, I'll talk about that really quick and only because the guys at IU, they've got tons of videos about float rotation. But float rotation is when you look, let's say a stock has 10 million outstanding shares um, of stock, uh, but they only have 5 million in the float the float is what's available to trade. So there's only 5 million shares um, available to trade. So if, if the volume goes over 5, five million, we're, we're starting to, to rotate that float, which means that the, the first wave of 5 million have now started you know, changing hands. And people are selling, people are buying, and you get a second wave, and that's called float rotation. And when you get a stock that does multiple float rotations um, in a day, 
it, it, like I said, things can get crazy. Um, AQXP a couple years ago went from like a buck fifty to fifty bucks. Um, they they happen, and the thing about it is, in is people. All I can say is, if you try to catch them, and hang on for those gigantic moves, it's tough. If you leave some on, if you scale into your position and leave some on, then, then you, you may catch one if you're lucky. But catching moves like this, guys, is, is initially it's luck. On the second day, it, <laughs> I'll use this chart for example. On the second day, you, you could have bought it 400000 and sold it 800000 But y you get my point is there's multiple opportunities to capitalize on these moves. You don't have to try and, and nail the bottom and try to nail the top. There's plenty of room in between for everybody and their mother to come out of this trade with some profit. So I think you guys can see that, let me zoom out a little bit. Right here, this low flow started in December. About every three months, we had a new batch that, that took off. And a lot of these charts look very, very, look at these charts. Look at those. They all look the same. There's patterns, and those are the things that you can track by looking at the volume. Shippers, same thing. Now, most recently, we had these reggae IPOs, um, ADOM, MIO, uh, SGBX, and, and these were a theme for a very short period of time where these low float reg A new IPOs um, were, they, they were blowing up. So we decided to play them because it was a theme that we saw. And, um, you know, w when you start, uh, when you can start seeing those themes develop and, and Michelle, you know, she, she, she's very good about seeing where these themes are occurring, when sector rotation might be happening, um, you know, and Michelle, we always joke she's got a, a, a crystal ball, um, but she's been doing this for you know a long time, um, and so she's seen this happen over and over again. So she starts to get a feel. She can see what things happen that signifies, um, you know, money might be changing into another theme, so to speak. And that's what you guys have to understand: is people will be in a stock until it, it goes up, and everybody's done with it going up, and then they'll sell and what happens if they're going to go look for somewhere else to put their money. And I'm talking about these themes like this. Um, and so we had bio and then into tech and then into shipping and then, you know, back to bio and tech. And so it, it just goes on again, cycles within cycles and markets within markets. This is just very simple. You can see that for a very short period of time, these things would IPO um, and then they just rip. And, and so when those happen, um, some of the things you can do is, is track these so you can see those patterns and so you can know when those themes are starting to develop. Um, so, real quickly, um, when we talk about all the different things that you can do with Momo, again, you guys, I, I, am, I am not... I, I'm not a Momo trader. I, it's just something I do um, in addition to swing trading. And it's just having another another tool in your toolbox to use when you can't use your hammer. You know, you, you, no one ever built a house with a hammer. You need other tools. And so swing trading is my hammer. Um, and then, you know, this Momo trading is, is my screwdriver. And hopefully I'll be able to add a third somewhere down the road. But I'm still working on one and two, and two is very, very infant right now. So... Um, you can see it's it's a process. Um, I don't want you to think that you'll get these right away. Uh, and that's why when I talked about in the beginning, um, you know what you need to be careful for is that they're very they're high risk uh, and they're crazy volatility. You could go in there and and you could buy you know a thousand shares of something and and at five bucks, and quite frankly, that thing can can rip you know a couple of bucks in a second, wipe out half your account. Uh, and on the flip side, you know, you could also, you know, add 50% to your account. It, it, it does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't. I just would rather deal in probabilities than luck. And that's what I'm trying to show right here with these plays is that um, if, if you're very diligent and, and very disciplined uh, and strict, you're not just going after everything that pops right off the open, you're waiting for a very specific amount of volume to occur at, 
and then you can start entering. Um, and so, and Michelle, Michelle likes to wait. Um, she, she's very good about this also. She likes to wait 30 minutes. I'm gonna wait till open to see how things digest and then I can play. Um, and and I, I've done that as well. And that works for Michelle. She likes to see how the action is perceived um, and digested by uh, the market first. And in me, my, my approach is more of an, an emotional approach. Um, after you know spending a couple years in the I, uh, the Investors Underground Momo room and, and learning quite a bit from them, um, and then just watching, you know, I didn't start playing these Momo plays again until until recently, and it was because I needed to watch and learn and come up with some sort of correlation that I could understand that could help increase my probability um, of consistency in that trade. Which you can see now after uh, pulling that data. Um, there is a way to be consistent. The, the challenge is, is that when you're in those trades and they're up 100% or whatever and the volume's crazy, it is human nature to want to stay into that trade and max it out. Um, or, you know, if you took profits quickly, it's human nature to want to go back for a second round and try to squeeze some more out of that. And what I've, what I've learned is that 3 to 10% over and over and over again is just fine for me. Um, and on these plays... I, I honestly think my success rate going back for a second time is, is probably like two out of ten, twenty percent maybe. Um, so I only go one, one, one toe dip in these, and it's a very, very quick toe dip, and then I'm out and back to your regularly scheduled program. Um, so I hope that made sense. Um, I, I kind of. I don't know if I breeze right through it, but the thing, this is very simple. To look at, looking at this, the, the the mathematics around it are simple. The time frames, etc. But doing it is not simple. This is this is my own system, and I still have a hard time with it because my emotions come into play. You know, I want to add to a position or just max it out when these things are going. But the this process protects me from doing that because typically that's when things start going, you know, against you is when you start getting in. A little bit heavier than you should and your emotions start creeping up and then you start making irrational decisions um, so uh, you, you, there's a theme in all of the webinars as well it's all about a process and even for these momo trades um, you know th this is my this is my process as a swing trader uh, that's how I'm gonna trade them so uh, I'm gonna open it up for questions if anybody has any questions um, we can go through those uh, we can also go through some charts if you guys want to look through some charts. You have questions about some of the recent plays, etc. So I'm just going to open it up um, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Let me get this uh, my question box. All right. Ah, VLTC, that was the one. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. Okay, so uh, question was, VLTC, that was the one that Icon's son had, that Icon bought some of the stocks a couple years ago that just ripped. Um, how do you know where the top is? Do you just average in? Um, I want to make sure I understand this question. I, I don't know where the top is. I'm not trying to guess it either. Um, and, and that's one of the things that, I strayed away from and why I put this in place for myself is so I wasn't, you know, trying to guess or anticipate or, or, or anything like that. It's just very simple. It opens, volume's there, I buy, I sell, and that's it. Um, so I, I, I don't know where the top is. I never will. Um, and for these, I don't average in. Just so you guys know, I do not scale into Momo trades. It's a one, it's a one shot, and I, I even play them, I play them small still, you know. For some of these things, you know, if they're like a dollar, I might go a thousand, couple thousand shares or what have you. But um, I, I just tend to play small. I just, I function better that way. How do you set your risk? Um, so, I mean, this is, for these Momo plays, this is my risk. My risk is no longer um, a, uh, a percentage or a, uh, you know, a price. My risk is not price. My risk is time on these trades. So it's a little bit different than swing trading and, and setting your risk as a percent of a trade 
and the capital allocated to it. This is a time trade. My risk is the time. The longer I'm in it, the more risk I have of, of losing those gains. And so my risk is what three minutes and seven minutes or two minutes and seven minutes. That's, that's what my risk is. So for these the stops, I, I don't have stops. You don't have time to put in a stop on these. It's looking at the volume, going, selling, done. So again, very, 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 very quick. Um, do I do any, oh, so, so do I convert any of these Momo trades into swing trades? Yes. Um, when, and it's, it's a little bit more in depth. It's the second part of this and maybe we'll do another webinar on it. But the second part of it has to do with um, the amount of volume, uh, the, the daily volume, you know, how many times average daily volume it occurred on that day where it closed at and then um, what it does in, in the post market. Um, so do I, do I convert them? Yes, but they, there's another set of parameters and sometimes those can work out well. You can see on some of those charts that they, they ran for multiple days. Um, and that's, uh, we did that with, we swung uh, Mayo in the swing trade room. I think we got it at 1050 and we, we were in there until the, the low 20s. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks for asking. Do I ever have a hard time getting filled with a trade? So with these Momo trades, it's a market order. It, it just There's not enough time to place a limit order. It's just a market order. Um, and if you have uh, the, uh, you can do a market on open. I mean, if something's going crazy in pre-market and you just wanna do it, I mean, you can do a market on open. So as soon as the market opens, um, at 6.30 my time, 9.30 normal time, um, it'll buy, you know, and, and then you'll have it and then you can sell right there. And some platforms even allow you to set a, a time stop so you can um, exit the trade after a certain period of time. So yeah, market orders, not limits. Uh, do you use a similar system for your swing trades? No, no, I don't. And that's a great question. Um, this, this webinar specifically was for, because I was getting a ton of questions on, on the, the day trades because there were so many opportunities lately. Um, my swing trade is totally different. And, and that's, um, you can find that on the uh, Trade on the Fly website. It's a, a three-part series on swing trading. Okay, next question they had to leave because there's a tornado warning. Okay. Good luck. You probably should. Do you find much slippage in market orders versus limit orders? I mean, it, it, when when you're dealing with time, um, yeah, there, there's slippage. There's every everywhere. There's slippage, and you can factor that in. Um, and that's uh, when, when you're looking at an overall. Uh, I've got another spreadsheet um, that's a little quite a bit more in depth. Um, and you can factor in slippage and I it, there's an average slippage um, for Momo trades, but w when in this very short period of time um, I'm sorry, I lost the question in this short period of time um, a couple cents is it doesn't matter to me because it's just a quick hitter I'm, I'm not in this to, to, to maximize it. I, I'm in it to scalp essentially. That's what it is. It's, it's a scalp trade um, a high probability or a scalp trade based on probability. Yeah, actually, so the the next one was, have you been shorting these as well? Yes, so when you, that's a great question, and thanks for bringing that up. And this can also be for another call or another webinar, but I, I probably won't be the best guy to do it because I'm not a short master. Themes, they, they, they just start with the blaze of glory and um, they, they fizzle out. So towards the end of these themes, once that Momo as a, as a whole, as a theme starts fizzling out, that's when I started shorting. So on names like um, MBRX, MTBC, uh, let's see, Caper and a AEZS. And ELTK. I think those are the only ones that I, I shorted, and they're they're the recent ones, and that's because it was losing steam. They were going, you know, they were ripping for the first thirty minutes, and then, 
you know, they were done. Or, they, or the first five minutes and then they were done. They were going flat. So as those themes, and again, this is one of those things that you can start getting a feel for and seeing, um, these th the themes don't last forever. You know, a certain sector doesn't go up forever. A certain genre or niche doesn't pop like that forever. Things need to, you know, rotate essentially. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a great question. And um, I honestly, I think it was... MBRX was my first short in, I don't know, two years, maybe. So it, it, it was very recent for me to start doing that again. Okay, Connie. Two questions. How long have you been in this chat room in particular? Um, I've been in here since 2014 I believe um, maybe a little bit longer but I believe 2014 and my scan to above 8 and below 8 now uh, yes so the reason was I, I like I just like um, doing this uh, I, I like helping new traders uh, you know people people know they shoot me a question on Twitter or email, it might take me a while to get back to you, but I'll get back to you. And the reason why I like helping is because I had people help me. You know, I had Michelle help me, I had Tom help me, I had Nate help me, um, Elk help me, uh, Elkwood. I had a lot of people help me, but I they didn't just offer it out of the goodness of their heart. I had to prove to them that I was someone that, you know, I, I wasn't just a, a flash in the pan. I actually wanted to learn. Um, and so that, that being said, I like helping traders, and a lot of the new traders, um, from my experience, they, they don't start out trading stocks in the higher price range for a couple of reasons. One is because they, they start with an account that's too small, and two, um, they, they operate on that, the same you know mind frame that I used to operate on, which is, oh, I can get more shares for this amount of money. And, and that's just, you know, if, if you're green coming in nine times out of 10, that's just how you think. And so, I wanted to make sure that in the scans I was um, providing those those plays for the lower priced traders as well as um, providing the plays in the upper range too. Um, so that really wasn't any major catalyst, uh, Connie. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was getting a, a good look. And great question, thank you. Okay, next question. How do you know the trade is not too far off late to get in on day two of the Momo moves? Um, so all, all of these are, are based off of um, a gap. So if it gaps up on day two, then I'm going to use the same principles. Um, and and it's, it's just, again, these are, these are probabilities. Um, if, if, if these Momos were still in theme right now, I'd still be trading them like this. If they were still ripping like this all the time, I, for the last six months, this is all I'd be trading. Because if I found something that worked consistently like that, and I could get those three to 10% gains just like that without thinking, I would just do that all the time. But the, the, the challenge is, is that these don't happen all the time. And so um, all of these trades were based off of a gap up and, and they're based off of a gap up at the opening bell. Um, if that, I hope that answered the question. So too, too late, too far, I don't do it intraday. These are all Momo, place for me are all first thing in the morning and that's it I never go back to them later in the day um, j because of you know my, my probabilities there's an 80% chance that I will lose money on it so I, I've learned after what three four five years now uh, to not go back for seconds Um, yes, probabilities and, and process. Those are the, the two things that uh, um, are, are helping me remove emotions. Emotions are, I, I am an emotional guy. I just, you know, I like to, I like to just be loud and, and have fun and, you know, I get angry and, and everything. I just, when I get, you know, my emotions are very large, so to speak. So in trading, you can imagine Whew, first couple of years were very, very trying, but um, putting the process in place um, with consistent probability has probably, it's eliminated a vast majority of those emotions. They're not gone, they never will be, but I've learned how to keep them out of my trading. 
Next question, what parameters are you looking at before you enter? Um, that is uh, right here, um, how, how you find them. The parameters I use are right here. And we'll, we'll obviously we'll make this available. Um, so you guys, you can go back through this and, and look more in depth because there's a, you know there's some data in here that you may want to look at. And um, if you're going if you're going through these it, it, historical data on on the, the the smaller time frames one three five charts going back you know for six months to a year sometimes on, on your your scanning software uh, it's not a hundred percent right. So the, these are within a couple pennies, uh, but most of them are listed at at the open. Um, in like FinViz, TradingView, stock charts, etc. What's the difference between trade on the fly and investors underground? Um, and will you do a swing trading webinar? Yes. So the swing trading webinar is available on the trade on the fly page and the free content. Um, it's also pinned on my Twitter feed. So the top uh, tweet in my feed is um, how you can go uh, watch part one, two, and three of the scan plan and tan series, and that's the swing trading. Um, and so the difference between investors underground and swing trading is, uh, I mean, really, that's it. I, I, investors underground, they, they, they like to trade Momo, um, and we like to trade bigger time frames. So and I'm not pigeonholing anybody in a corner because I know that Nate and, and all those guys, they swing trade as well, just like we do day trading as well. We just, the majority of, of our trades and trade on the fly are longer time frame trades, uh, more over a couple of uh, days, weeks, sometimes months um, versus minutes, hours. So I, ho I hope that answered your question. Okay, good. Um, what platform do I use? I use E-Trade. I use E-Trade because of the baby. I saw the commercial in 2013. My neighbor told me he had an E-Trade account, so I got an E-Trade account. That literally was my due diligence, and I still use it. And you know what? I love it because it's easy to use. I'm very familiar with it, um, and I've been with them. You know, I have a relationship with them now. So um, I, I have E-Trade. That's, that's my platform, and that's what I use for the... Um, the, uh, oh, you, yeah, ways to trade them. I'm sorry. So E-Trade is for the morning movers um, pre-market. This is an Excel sheet right here. This is not within a platform. This is I just this is manually. I go, I like to do things a little bit old-fashioned where I, I, I go back through these trades and all of this data I input hand by hand, cell by cell. Call me crazy, but I, I like to do it because I feel like I can get to know the price patterns and, and movements a little bit better if I'm doing doing that um, input, that data input or that data entry within the trade, if that makes sense. Okay, I think I think that's it for uh, questions, guys. Um, really great questions. I appreciate you asking them. I hope that. Uh, I hope, if anything, I hope this just got you to think outside the box a little bit, um, because a lot of the times, you know, we get on Twitter and you want to do what everybody else is doing and yada yada yada. Um, this is just what what I did on my own to help me increase, you know, probabilities in certain trades. So um, it's you guys can do that too. Uh, it, it just takes a little bit of time. So. Anyways, I uh, hope it helped. If you guys have any questions, well, you can send them to psycho at tradeonthefly.com and uh, you can also follow Michelle at Offshore Hunters um, and myself at Psycho on Wall Street and shoot us a DM. Um, we do offer a free trial, so if anybody wants to come in and check it out, um, just uh, we, there's a, a trial link on the front page. You guys can go there um, or we'll probably email you one or what have you and um, we can uh, go from there. So if not, I hope you guys had a good time, and until next time, enjoy your evening.